Even for that, I haven't slept much this week. Too much work and so many stupid dreams. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and about what happened to me during the war. It can be really boring. Um, but, you know, if I don't talk about that and you're not familiar, then you will not understand why I'm talking about some other things. So, um, and at times it can be repetitive. Uh, yeah, I, um, I was born in 68 in uh, former Yugoslavia. And, uh, you know, these days I'm introduced as a Bosnian. And, um, but I always used to declare myself as a Yugoslav, and I, I, I was a Yugoslav. And um, for example, if we went from Bosnia to, to Serbia, then we, we would say we are Bosnians, just like, but outside Yugoslavia, you know, we were Yugoslavs. So it's like Texans. In California would say they're Texans, but in Bosnia they'd say they're Americans. So, um, and most of the people in former Yugoslavia, I, I, I want to believe, saw themselves as Yugoslavs, not as, you know, uh, members of various ethnic groups. Um, I, I could say that my child, childhood was carefree. Um, it was a peaceful environment. And, um, of course, I knew nothing about politics. Um, and. Um, in a way, it was good. I don't think children should know anything about politics, and unfortunately, I'll talk a little bit later. Politics plays a great part in uh, Bosnian, Bosnian children today, in a very negative way. Um, so, yeah, when I, I, I was born in a Muslim village, and um, I knew that there were some people, you know, who lived in the villages around my village who were somehow different. And uh, when I started going to school, I came in touch with these kids and realized that they were just like myself, they had the same interests. You know, there were some small different differences, um, some smaller cultural differences, but um, not really much we had much more in common with each other. And uh, so life, life seemed to be good. And um, then I think, I was still very young, but the first changes happened after late Yugoslav president Tito died in 1980. And of course, I mean, there, there, there was a, there was this big atmosphere of fear that you know Yugoslavia could be invaded by Russians, by you know, former Soviet Union, and um, uh, that's actually the first time in my life uh, when I experienced real fear. I was only 12 at the time, so apart from that fear, I, I didn't understand um, uh, much bigger complications that his death created at the time, because his death, I know now, created a large political vacuum, because, you know, he was a very strong leader, and um, uh, when he died, the leadership that was running the country was uh, quite ineffective. Uh, we, we had a presidency which, which I think had nine members. Uh, we had eight constituent, constituent units, so each unit um, had a member sitting on the presidency, and uh, Top Army General was the Minister of Defense, so I think he was sitting on, on the presidency as well. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to run a country like that. Um, and um, you know, this was the time when former Yugoslavia experienced a big economic crisis as well. And I, I really believe if we didn't have that uh, really big economic crisis, uh, you know, that we wouldn't have those wars in, in former Yugoslavia. Um, I, I was 20 when I, uh, when I realized the, the power propaganda. Uh, I was doing my national service, which was compulsory for former Yugoslavia. And for years before that, you know, we would see news about what, um, you know, me me media people who were actually Communist Party people, uh, they were talking about Albanians in, in Kosovo who wanted, you know, to separate from former Yugoslavia. 
So um, I actually believed those stories. And when I was doing my national service, I, I, I served together with many Albanians from Kosovo, who appeared, you know, to be, let's say, completely normal, just like myself. But uh, I, I, I started to realize that uh, stories that you could read in newspapers and see on television were not exactly true. And, uh, and later, later on, I, I realized, uh, uh, actually, after I came out of Bosnia, how, how powerful the propaganda is and it actually works. Um, so, Yeah, so the situation was getting worse, and then towards the end of the 1980s, um, we had, uh, you know, former Yugoslavia was a communist country, one party rule, and then suddenly we were told that, uh, you know, whether anyone could organize or, or establish his own political party. And uh, the most terrible thing was that uh, those political parties were established along ethnic lines. So, for example, uh, the biggest Serb party was called the Serb um, uh, Democratic Party. The Croatian party was, uh, had a similar name. Uh, and the, the main Muslim party, funnily enough, didn't have Muslim in its name, but, but people knew that uh, because it was established and run by most prominent Muslims in Bosnia, that uh, you know, it was a Muslim party. And um, I actually didn't quite like that situation. I quite naively believed that um, being a Yugoslav, I thought, well, you know, uh, it didn't take much to realize that there, there was a threat that the country would fall apart. So I thought the army should really intervene, you know, and, and save the country. And uh, that was a very naive way of thinking. Um, and, uh, and during this time, you know, one, one person uh, spotted an opportunity, you know, to, to fill this political vacuum. Uh, and I'm quite sure you know this person called Slobodan Milosevic. And um, uh, funnily enough, I don't believe that he was a nationalist. And uh, Warren Zimmerman, who was a, who, who was a U.S. ambassador in from Yugoslavia, and he also wrote in his book that Milosevic was not really a nationalist. And uh, I read somewhere that uh, he never went to visit, you know, wounded soldiers in hospitals, so he never attended any army parades. Um, and, you know, he was just a clear opportunist, but a clever one at the same time. Uh, so. Um, I mean, we can try to analyze what happened, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, it became obvious that, you know, communists tried several times to reform the system to keep the country together, they failed. So it became obvious the country was going to disintegrate. So, overnight I became Bosnian, so, and, um, you know, some of my friends became uh, Serbians or Croatians or uh, but in the case of Bosnia, it was much worse. And um, so then, you know, uh, we had one war in Slovenia which lasted just for a couple of days because Milosevic didn't have many interests in, in Slovenia. It's quite a homogenous country. And then he, he um, yeah, yeah, the army actually sided with Milosevic. And the um, army had a, a large vested interest. Uh, the army budget was, was huge, so uh, it also, this situation showed that even people in the army were basically looking after themselves, which I want to talk a little bit more later. Um, so uh, I could see my neighbors going to fight in Croatia against. Croats, my Serb neighbors, and they also wanted us, um, 
Muslims do not in fact with them, and we thought most of us, this is, this is not our war. And uh, then they started threatening that they were going to attack us as well. And uh, you, you actually don't want to believe it, uh, because even though it might have happened to your parents, you have no living memory of, of such events, so you just don't want to believe it. And um, when you, you and these troops move into Croatia, um, my Serb neighbors returned uh, to, to my region, but some weeks before that I could see Serb nationalists attacking uh, Muslim villages and, and uh, towns and cities in eastern Bosnia. And uh, it's, it's clear as day that their threats are real, but you still refuse to believe that your neighbors will do it to you. And uh, so when my Serb neighbors finally came back to Bosnia, it happened. I, I, I had several opportunities to leave before this, but uh, uh, again, naively I thought, well, my family has lived here for hundreds of years, we can't just, just leave. And um, I wish I did. Um, so, like I said, I had a lot of sub friends, and, um, and there was one particular guy, I always talk about him. Uh, his name was Mirko, his name is Mirko Jokic. And we played football together in, in our uh, uh, primary school. We went together to the same secondary school. And um, we'd always stop uh, when we came across each other and, and talk to each other. And uh, th those were really warm encounters. And then about a year before the war started, I noticed that uh, when, he came, when we came across each other, he wouldn't even look at me that long weekly. And, um, um, and this is basically uh, uh, the role of propaganda, how uh, it, it, it makes people uh, begin to believe what you, you know, uh, show them on television and in newspapers. And, um, for example, just before the war broke out in in, in Bosnia, uh, said nationalists took control of the, lo the, the local TV transmitter in my region. So you could no longer see news from different parts of former Yugoslavia, you could just see pictures from, from Belgrade. So I guess if at the beginning you had any doubts or any questions about you know, those images, if, if you see exactly the same images, exactly, exactly the same uh, messages over and over again, you actually start believing those messages. So uh, you know, my, my village was attacked by these forces and um, we were forced to leave and uh, we were passed to different locations. Um, I ended up at, uh, at a concentration camp which was about 45 kilometers from, from my village and um, it, was a, it was a disused iron ore mine um, and the night that we were brought to this place uh, it was it was very late at night. I thought they were going to kill us because you know the the mine contained large uh, pits. So I thought they'll kill us and bury us in, in those pits. And it, it it didn't happen. Some people, unfortunately, got killed on our arrival. Um, the rest of us were squashed within rooms uh, that, that were previously used by miners. And. Um, uh, I was put uh, together in one room with some 500 other people and uh, there was actually no space to sit on the floor so the, the conditions were horrendous. There, there was no food in the first four days I think, uh, but that was not the worst thing. The worst thing is that you don't know what's going on and that nobody seemed to be in charge when uh, some guys were brave enough to ask our gods what was going on. They would just reply, you know, as much as, as you do. And then, um, and most gods were my former neighbors, former schoolmates, uh, former policemen, on whose protection we actually relied uh, before the war. And um, this personal thing is, that it is, 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 the, is, is the worst thing, because I mean, it's, um, 
it doesn't make sense to say that um, the, the pain is smaller or, or less if you know you are tortured by strangers, but it's uh, the, the betrayal of trust which makes all the difference. And it makes things even worse if you decide to, if you survive and decide to go back one day, and then you know you have to live, you know, with the people who, who betrayed you in the past. So how can you trust them again? And um, so, you know, some of my guides were people that I went to the same class with. I shared my school desk, school desk with, with one of them. And about two weeks ago, before my village was attacked. I came across him at his grandfather's battery station in the village where the camp was. And um, we, we had a normal conversation, but I bet at the time he had a rifle at home and a uniform. Because uh, a couple of weeks later when I was in the camp, he came to the camp in his uniform and his rifle. And, uh, and uh, he stopped me in one corridor. And, um, he just had a conversation with me like we were at the same petrol station, like, uh, you know, it was completely normal. And uh, I'd love to, to, to see him one day and, and have a conversation about that conversation to, to ask what, what was going on through his, through his head, because it's incomprehensible. It just doesn't make any sense at all. And, um, and there was another uh, schoolmate called Miloita Berich, and um, he didn't do anything to me. Camp, uh, and he even greeted me once. Uh, he asked me, "How is it?" I said, "Well, it's going to get better." He said, "Yes, it is." <laughs> While people were being, you know, tortured, killed, and women raped, um, and um, Milot is today a policeman. He he's supposed to pr provide protection for the people in my village. Um, my brother reported him a couple of times because uh, I think there was uh, uh, some kind of law that people who participated in such activities could not serve the police force, but uh, there was a time limit, but uh, because people did not return till early, uh, I think late 99 or early 2000, the deadline passed, so he became, he, he stayed in the police force. But that's part of the cosmic reality, I guess. Um, I was also interrogated by my secondary school teacher, and um, he, uh, I, I liked the guy a lot because he was, he was charming, uh, both guys and, and, and girls liked him, I think for different reasons, <laughs> but uh, he, he was a really nice, witty guy, and he was very generous to us with, with marking, and, uh, uh, but when, when when he interrogated me, he, he knew exactly who I was, but he refused to acknowledge that he, he really tried his best to humiliate me. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't understand his swagger. Uh, he felt all-powerful. Uh, uh, and, and I thought, well, this is wrong, you know, the guy who... He, he, he was not just teaching me my, my uh, subjects in, in school, he was teaching me about life. You know, this is wrong, that my teacher is doing something like this. And um, so I stayed in this camp for two and a half months. Um, actually, I was kept there, I didn't stay there. And uh, during, during this time, incredible things were taking place. Uh, you know, people were not just interrogated, there were no court trials, uh, uh, people were tortured, uh, sadistic torture took place. Uh, there were some women in the camp and, um, and the guards would rape them at night and the same guards would ask them in the morning, you know, has anyone done anything to you the previous night? Yeah. And, um, but, but there's one very interesting thing, at the beginning, most of the guards, when we came across them, would actually drop their heads down because they, you, could, you could see they felt ashamed. They knew we did nothing wrong. And as the time went 
melatonin, they, they slowly started beating people. And uh, it's incredible that in the, in the beginning, uh, in the end, they loved what they were doing. So uh, I, I, I still don't understand this transformation from, you know, uh, these people being, well, you know, peaceful individuals. And uh, over time they became bloodthirsty. And um, it's not because, I, I, I really don't believe it because, you know, they're slaves, and they're human beings. Um, and it's the only conclusion I could, I, I could come to, and it's just a speculation. You know, when you find yourself in a position to decide between life and death, when you start playing the role of, of gods, then that's what happens. And um, I guess the most important thing is, uh, if you know you can do whatever you like to do, but you will not be held accountable for that, that's what happens. Um, I, I just wanted to survive. Uh, we, we had a radio, so listen, we were listening to news. We could also hear news from radios out of Croatia. And there were talks about a foreign intervention, that this couldn't really go on. So, because we were desperate people, uh, we, we believed this would happen. And of course, years later, when I had more time to re reflect on this, uh, I realized there is no intervention on humanitarian ground. It really, it really doesn't happen. Um, you know, states intervene for strategic reasons. If, if their um, strategic interests at home are rather threatened, or if um, you know their their opponents' strategic uh, if their opponents become weak, so you know their strategic interests become available for grabs, that's when, you know, uh, powerful states like the US and Britain intervene. Uh, they really don't care about people like us. And that's why I'll never trust another politician in my life again. Um, so, I was, um, I think I'm talking for too long, so I'll try to cut it down. Um, There were other camps in my region, and basically, I I don't think those of us who stayed in this camp for the last month were meant to stay. Um, I don't know why, because I was not in any sort of threat. I didn't even have weapons, but uh, it's uh, it's strange the way it worked. Anyway, uh, there were some negotiations taking place in, in London, and uh, somebody. Uh, posed a question to Radha Karaj, who wasn't the leader about the camps, because some reports about the camps appeared uh, in Newsday in the States. And he said, of course not. Of course these places don't exist. There are journalists who, who want you know, to come and find out such places are welcome. But the journalists who reported about them, well, he, got, well, he happened to be in London. So he, he got to the studio and, and he pressed it really hard. And then a couple of days later, some journalists did arrive in the camp, some British journalists. And um, the said authorities presented to their cameras people who, 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 for them, looked sort of okay. But, you know, the pictures were terrible. They shocked the world, so the said authorities had to close down the camp. And um, uh, I was transferred with my brother who was with me. All, all this time to another camp, which was uh, within the same region. But, um, you know, conditions in the second camp were absolutely horrendous, but uh, compared to, to the Amistad camp, you know, uh, manager was like a five-star hotel. So we, we slept in cow sheds in, in the second camp on, on gravel or on concrete. And, uh, you know, we were squashed like sardines, uh, but we had two meals a day, and um, whereas in Amherst, most of the time we had not one meal a day, and um, on some days there was no food at all. But for me, the most important thing was that the camp was regularly visited by members of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they wrote down.
called my name. And, um, uh, you know, uh, that was one of the most significant moments in my life because for two and a half months I did not exist at all. And um, it may be strange to you to hear that, uh, you know, it meant so much to me, but I, I, I knew that if anything happened to me after that, then the world would know uh, where, where you, uh, I was taken to this place, and that I, I was the right place at the time. Uh, I mean, we were most awakened at the second camp. Some, some people were exchanged, but we knew where, where they went. A few individual, individuals who had some links with, with some powerful Serbs were released. So it was just a waiting game. And uh, we knew that some negotiations were taking place between the Red Cross and uh, Bosnian government authorities and Bosnian Serb authorities, but they've never revealed to us details of those uh, negotiations. And it was quite understandable if they agreed to, to release us and it didn't happen. That would be a tremendous disappointment. But when the weather became uh, very severe and the temperatures can go down to minus 20 degrees and uh, everybody must have realized we would perish there. So, uh, you know, it's like camping in this sort of weather. You know, you can't, you can't survive like that. Then um, we were released on a condition to, to, to leave the country for good. And uh, there's one funny detail. Uh, we were uh, made to sign a big piece of paper which said that, you know, we were leaving willingly and willingly leaving our property to, to the Serb authorities. But it, it, it's funny because by this point in time, um, you know, uh, where, where homes, our homes once stood, there were, not, there were no even bricks left anymore. So, uh, but I was, I was more than willing to sign that piece of paper. And um, then uh, I was transferred to Croatia uh, at the time, I, uh, I I believed that you know the the Bosnian conflict was going to engulf the whole of Europe. Uh, much later, I realized how well contained it was. Uh, you know, people inside Bosnia could have slowed slow to reach each other to the last pass, and it wouldn't spread outside the country. Uh, so I, I I thought I don't want to stay in Europe. I want to go to the States, Canada, Australia, and um, I was. I was put on a list for, for Canada, which got misplaced somewhere, and I ended up in, in England, which I thought in the end was, was the best possible place at the time for me uh, to come. Uh, I've, I've, I've never come used to the weather anyway, so... Um, So when, when I came to England, uh, my visa was, I was given a visa for six months, and the visa said I was expected to return to former Yugoslavia once the situation improved. Um, I really, uh, I, uh, when, I, when I was in Croatia, I didn't want to go back. Some people decided to go back and fight, and uh, I, I have to be honest, I was too fearful. I didn't want to lose my life. I just wanted to, to get away from, as far away from, from it as possible. And I really feel no shame about that. Um, so, I mean, with this visa, I thought, I really, you know, don't want to go back. Um, so, uh, most people think once you get out of the conflict, you're fine. But that's when, when the real struggle begins. You know, when I was in these camps, I didn't ask myself, why am I here? You know, I didn't do anything wrong. But once I got out, I started asking myself those questions. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was a victim, so uh, I guess I blamed my, you know, torturers for, for all those things. I, I wanted to have a better life, but 
It was like a closed circle. There was no way out of it. And so you, you feel imprisoned. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many people stayed alive, but they never survived. Um, you know, they may live for, 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 for decades, but it's just waiting for the moment to die, which is, which is the, the, the biggest tragedy of uh, or, or, or such experiences. And so, so for years I tormented myself with, with these pointless questions because no, I had no one to talk to who could actually give me some answers. And um, until it finally dawned on me, you must accept that th th this is real, this has happened to you. And uh, once the acceptance arrives, then you can move on. And um, maybe other people wouldn't express themselves uh, in this way, but this is how it's worked for me. So uh, I hate labels, but in, in a way, that's when I moved to the next stage, when I became a survivor. And um, uh, for years and years and years, you know, people would introduce me like that. And I thought, uh, well, I, I, I did have uh, a lot of therapy. I asked myself for this, and uh, you know, health professionals when they face it, they haven't got a clue how to act. You know, in, in that kind of situation. And back in early 1990s, uh, you know, they were not trained for uh, to deal with people with war traumas or post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's just a name. Um, and. Um, I went back to Bosnia on the 10th anniversary of the attack on my village. It, it was purely coincidental, it just happened to be the 10th anniversary. Uh, I was, I was uh, searching for some answers. Uh, I, I wanted to speak to different people, and one of the people that I spoke to was the second, was the, actually we call it the middle school teacher, uh, who interrogated me in the camp. Uh, he, was, he, he was not really prepared to talk to me. Uh, and I could see that he was troubled. Uh, people didn't want to take responsibility for what they did. It was easier to blame everyone than, than to take responsibility. Um, but when I told him that he interrogated me, he, he did accept to talk to me. And um, I mean, he was just giving me various excuses for, for, for what happened. We were all equally guilty. It was pointless to say. You know, uh, it, they were responsible, and I was not. And uh, I, I could see that he was he, he was talking about forgiveness, and I, I could see that he wanted me to forgive him, but I couldn't. I couldn't. I thought, how can I forgive someone who expresses no remorse, who who uh, who, who cannot take any responsibility for what he did? And uh, I, I I was thinking about forgiveness for years. Um, and um, it's, it's a really heavy burden, at, at least it was for me. Um, it's, it, it's not something pleasant to live with. Um, I, I made subsequent trip, trips to Bosnia, I spoke to various people, uh, you know, uh, seven people. Well, you know, we didn't start it. I said, well, who started it? Americans, Pakistanis. And uh, real, <laughs> real answers. Um, and um, I, I guess um, I guess they, they must carry a heavy burden as well. Um, so about two years ago, it's quite funny because I was having a shower. And it just came up to me, and I said, I forgive you. And um, this huge, huge burden fell, fell off my shoulders. I, I had felt a huge relief. Uh, uh, and, it's, and it's actually got more to do with me than, than with these individuals. Because you know, if I tell them something like this, they might say, well, piss off. You know, why are you saying this? Uh, we don't care. But, uh, it, it helped me and so much, and I realized it's it's actually the biggest gift that I have. Uh, so I mean, I, I've lived 
lived here for 17 years now and a couple of years ago, but I, I can never detach myself from Bosnia. Actually. Sometimes I have to say, well, oh, you know, uh, I can't deal with this anymore, but after some time I just have to go back to it. It's, it's uh, I don't know whether it's um, some kind of men mental illness or my care for this place and these people. I can't, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Because uh, it, it's, it's a struggle when you try to do something, uh, and, you know, over there, and then I can't imagine how frustrating it must be for the people on the ground, like a friend of mine in here who, who's living and working there, how it must be for them to, to live that kind of life every day. I, I decided to set up a project with my ex partner to, to work with children in, in my region. And when I went to school, uh, like I said, you know, Schools and classes were mixed, and now the you know in, in Bosnia there's an education apartheid. So the, the school, my primary school, is completely Serb, and uh, I don't know whether they're allowed to teach old history in schools now. Uh, but I, I know that, for example, Bosnia used to have three separate school curricula. So Serbs would teach their children in history classes that it was a civil war. Uh, Croats would uh, teach their children that it was a war of defense. And Muslims would teach their children that it was a war of aggression. So I, I thought these kids are actually the biggest victims of the war. And most of them were born after the war. And it, it actually fills you with horror when you realize that uh, they're being trained as, as future soldiers to fight each other. And uh, that's, that's a horrible crime. And uh, it's, not, it's not a fact that you know, they're being taught this in school, but they're being taught this at home as well. Uh, when I went back to Bosnia for the first time, I asked one of my crazy neighbors. He's really, really crazy, but he told me something profound. Uh, I, we were educated when you come across someone in Bosnia, whether you know, know them or not, you greet them. And I said, does it still happen? He said, yes, uh, a certain kid comes across you and, you know, he'll, he'll greet you, but he'll drop his head down. So he doesn't know what happened during the war, but he does know what his parents tell him. So uh, we started this project and it was a real struggle. I, um, but I thought, if we want to have peace in Bosnia, uh, this is the only option for people to, to start working together again. The only other alternative is to have another war, but it's, it's, it's an option at all. And um, I also felt that, you know, for me, Slav history is like a game of ping pong. You know, this is what, what you did to us in the past, this is what, what we did to you in the past. People, you know, never made efforts to, to, to sit down and, and listen to each other's stories uh, because, you know, uh, different sides may have different truths. Uh, but if we are not prepared to listen to each other, then uh, the cycle of violence just, you know, keeps going. So, so I thought, well, maybe in my small way I'd like to try and stop that cycle of violence. So that, uh, uh, I will also entertain the thought of going you know, back to Bosnia to live in Bosnia. So I thought, one day if you have a family, you, you, you don't want your children to fight another war again. Um, and it, it, it hasn't been easy to, to work with this project because the um, uh, head school, the place, the, the Serb school, uh, he was my former Serb crowd teacher. When I was in the camp, he was my guard. But it's worse than that when the camp commander was on trial in, in Sarajevo. He testified uh, on his behalf about his good character. And he also told the court lies about the camp. So I thought, I mean, you can't work, you can't work with him. Uh, you know, he's a bastard. But uh, once you put your emotions to one side, you realize, well, it's actually more important to work with him. If he's willing to work with you than with two million moderates, and he's a very influential person in this community as well. 
and he also gives you access to these children. And um, I, I, I could see how uh, he's been changing all the time, which is which is fascinating. And um, so the and, 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 and these children, you know, when they found themselves on the same ground uh, in my village, where actually some terrible things happened. And I, I don't believe that any ground should be held sacred. I, I, I wanted to show myself, probably for selfish reasons, and, and to the world that wonderful things can happen in, in the same place as well. And uh, in, in, in the long time, I'd like to work on a project in Bosnia to, to create this safe space for, for my former neighbors and, and neighbors from my village to come together and talk to each other without accusing each other of who did what during the war. So that, uh, uh, because I believe that's the only way to, to bridge the differences that exist and perhaps uh, in, 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 in a long time recreate the community that, that existed. But it was amazing that that was sort of a long, long time plan. And not only that these children realized that they were all the same, that they made, made friends and that they wanted more. So uh, we are trying to organize it this year again, but we are struggling with some funds because uh, it's, it's so hard to get funding for projects like this, but uh, we're still short of some money. But we are trying, we are making efforts in, in all different ways to get the last 7,000 pounds to, to, to organize it. And, but most importantly, you know, these children brought their parents to this ground. And um, I mean, just amazing things happened, uh, which proves that if, if you, you know, uh, give people space to, to communicate effectively with each other, to have some sort of dialogue, that it works. And that's not something that politicians in Bosnia want, because they're all bastards. So they just look after themselves. Uh, there were nobodies before the war, and most of them are millionaires now. It's the way it has the money come from, from people suffering. And um, um, I thought that one, one of my neighbors was severely tortured in the Alaska camp. Um, he, he had two brain tumors removed as a result of, of, of that torture. So I thought he would be one of my biggest opponents to organize such an event in, in, at such a place. But he, he thought it was great. said to me that there was a Serb school teacher, there's a school next to the ground, and uh, when we were ordered to gather on this ground, she appeared in a Serb army uh, uh, officer uniform, and she carried a gun, and uh, he never forgot that moment, but when we organized this event last year, he said, this is the, the first time ever that we greeted each other, so it was, it was just incredible. It was, um, okay, I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kunlun. Um, you spoke very movingly about a number of uh, key themes, I think, of uh, this conference at the seminar series as well. So we will pick up on quite a few of the different issues. So thank you very much for this, Kunlun. Um, could I then leave the floor to Rahab, who's going to speak on uh, Naivashu's neighbors surviving Kenya's post-election violence. Good morning, everybody. Once again, my name is Rahab. I come from Kenya, and I'm a Kikuyu. I need to mention that I'm Kikuyu because in the Naivasha violence, the Kikuyus were the aggressors. I'll start by giving a brief background of Naivasha and Kenya in general. Naivasha is an, is an administrative district in the Rift Valley province. 
and it is 90 kilometers away from Nairobi, which is the capital city of Kenya. As per the 99 national census, the urban population is was 14,563, so it is a very tiny town with only four major streets. The town is cosmopolitan, though the Kikuyus are the majority, with substantial immigrants who are mainly from the rural, the Kisi, Karajin, and Luya ethnic communities. Most Kikuyus engage in large and small-scale businesses and own residential and commercial premises, which they rent out, they rent out to Kikuyu and Ankikuyu tenants. And many of the Nangikuyus are employed in the over 65 flower farms, while others are fishermen in the Lake Naivasha. Um, it, is, it is important we, we also know about the post uh, independence history so that at least we know where we, as Kenyans we came from. From the first post independence times, the ruling class has used trade policy and cultural prejudice as a raw material of control and manipulation of the masses. The first Kenyan president, Jomo Kenyatta, who was also a Kikuyu, fell out with his vice president, Jaramogi Odinga, who, is a ruo, who was a ruo, on ideological principles and the differences took a tribe of time. The Kikuyus took a biding oath in 1869 to ensure that the country's leadership never left Kikuyu run. That was after, was after the assassination of a very prominent uh, politician from rural run, Tom Boyle. And there was a lot of protest that threatened Kenyatta's government. The Kikuyus consider themselves the most resourceful of the over 42 Kenyan tribes and swore never to be ruled by the animals from the, from the West. That is a derogatory term we used to refer to the non Kikuyus, especially the Ruos. The Kikuyu further hold the Ruo in contempt for their culture of not circumcising their men. We refer to them as, as grown up boys. The other Kenyan tribes, especially the Ruo and the Karaji, distrust the Kikuyu as they view them as thieves and conmen. They also claim that the Kikuyu are domineering and selfish. That is a very sad history. But despite all the historical resentments and distrust, all ethnic groups coexisted harmoniously in the Ivasha, doing business, worshipping, and bringing up their families together as good neighbors. But the harmony started developing cracks during the 2005 new constitution referendum. There had been a political fallout after President Kibaki refused to honor a pre-election memorandum of understanding. The referendum campaign speeched the Kikuyu, who were supporting the draft against the majority non Kikuyu who opposed it. So the Kikuyus were in the banana camp, and which later became Party of National Unity, and the, uh, the non Kikuyus were in the already democratic movement led by the current Prime Minister, Raida Odinga. The orange camp that was opposing the draft won, but the country was deeply paralyzed. Neighbors realized that they were living side by side with their enemies and attributed all their social and political problems to the enemy. The general elections that were held in the year 2007 and the politics was as far as them. Most vernacular radio stations incited the people and advised them to put all their votes in one basket so as to defeat the enemy. Religious groups also took ethnic positions, and musicians released hits extolling their people to check the enemy. Hate text messages were flying all around. At this point, even the young children knew who their enemy was. But the people of Naivasha, in the midst of all that, thought after the campaign period was over, the tensions and distrust would disappear nationally. On the 27th day of January 2008, a month after the controversial presidential results, the Kikuyu in Naivasha decided that the rural and the Kalijins had to go. Uh, I call the, the, the presidential election results controversial because nobody know, knows who won. Even the electoral commission chairman said that he was not sure who really won, but the fact is that Mwai Kibaki was won in and he was thrown in at night. After a week of planning and fundraising by a local politician and some prominent business people, the, uh, the Mungiki, a Kikuyu illegal militia known for its smuggling styles and ruthlessness, was contracted to lead the eviction of the rural and the Karajin tribes. Neighbors who turned against their neighbors gave different reasons for their actions. 
one scenario was, the, was that there was a lot of propaganda circulated by the organizers of the violence. The propaganda effectively whipped up people's emotions and turned them into killing machines uh, when people felt that they were defending themselves. People were told that the carriage from the North Rift Valley were marching towards Naivasha to attack the Kikuyu and destroy their properties. It was also arranged that the Naivasha prison warders, who are Midland and Kikuyus, would join the advancing army and with the support of the local Kikuyu, kill all Kikuyu. With the support of the local who kill all Kikuyu. The propaganda went further and claimed that all Kikuyu prison warders had been ordered to return their guns to the army. That's ensuring that the only armed guards at the prison complex were the non Kikuyu. There are other reports that the Mongiki from central Kenya were marching towards Naivasha to attack the Kikuyu who had failed to join in the eviction of the non Kikuyu who were killing their people in other regions. It was said that whoever did not join in the evictions and killings would be killed by the Mungiki. The propaganda has ensured that the, kill the people's killing momentum stayed day high, it stayed high day and night. These days patrolled the estates, streets at night, and during the day hunted for any hiding lure or carriage. Another scenario was that there were, there were those in the community who were confused that they were avenging the Kikuyu who were being killed in parts of the North Rift Valley. The sight of railways ferrying Kikuyu families feeding, freeing from the North Rift made them decide that they would avenge their tribesmen by killing and evicting the enemy within. Another scenario was that some in the estate said that they were killing their neighbors for they had dared challenge their political leadership. A Lua man who had lived in, in, a, in a slum called character for more than eight years was killed and he had his penis chopped off and placed in his mouth. His testes were stretched off and put in his side. A screaming five-year-old son was told by the neighbors to get help from the ODM leader, Raira Odinka. The boy today is mentally unstable and keeps on calling to his father, telling him to get up as they were cutting his head and his teeth. Another scenario was that others killed because in the confusion they got an opportunity to loot. There were stories of families spreading out the estates, father, mother, and children, and helping in the pointing out of their rural or carriage in neighbors' house, houses. After the Mungiki and the locals left, they were left behind cutting away all that they could, and after taking the rooted goods home, joined other attacking groups. The Mungiki never used to loot. They just uh, uh, broke into people's houses, and destroyed everything. Uh, but what they were not able to destroy, that's what the looters carried away. Other jobless young men joined in for addition, in, for, in addition of seizing the opportunity to loot, they were proud to defy rule and order and work side by side with the dreaded, dreaded Kikuyu militia. Yet others were forced to join in the killing by other neighbors and the militia who patrolled the street estates and ensured that all men were out there patrolling and hunting for the enemy. Those who were fouled and numbed were beaten up and given machetes. Women led houses, households were forced to buy food for the militia. The women were made to wash as their neighbors were killed. A friend told me of how she was forced to stand by and wash as her neighbor, felt a rural neighbor, stabbed him in the stomach, and when he took time to die, slit his throat and licked the bloody machete explaining that the blood would protect him from being haunted by the dead man. Others joined in out of envy and malice. A Kikuyu woman directed the militia to her neighbor's house and ensured that all her clothes were burned, as the neighbor used to show off in church with her Raila Odinga Ruka look at her. According to her, the rural encouraged in both what they deserved. Yeah. In the process, my house and her, my office and office were broken into by my neighbors who looted my furnishers and I was targeted because I helped the enemy. In just two days, 45 people were killed in this tiny, tiny town of just four streets, and over 15,000 people were displaced and properties worth millions were looted or destroyed. Even today, there are no signs of remorse or guilt as people simply refer to the period, to that period as when they chased away the rules. The political leaders have now formed new alliances in preparation for the next general elections that will be held in the year 2012. And from their hate messages and political rallies which are heard by the media, I'm sure the violence is not over yet. 
though the targeted communities may, de may, de be, may be different this time round. The lack of punishment confirms justification, laying the groundwork for, laying the, groundwork for the next invention. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Um, I'm sure there will be a um, lot of opportunities to I can ask questions on um, on various issues that um, come out of brought up here, um, especially perhaps for those who are not familiar with the, with the Kenyan context and, 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 the, and the type of violence that followed the um, election. So thank you very much, Rana, for, for starting us off on, on such a discussion. Um, so I hand over the floor and the PowerPoint to um, Paulina Mishkovsky, uh, who's going to talk about um, her experiences working with uh, refugees in Uganda. Her presentation is entitled What It Takes to Heal Trauma Among Internally Displaced Persons in Kampala, Uganda. Um, good morning. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, Rahab and Kamal for their presentations, which I think are incredibly powerful, and to acknowledge that what I will have to say will not be powerful in the same way. Um, like most people working in this field, I have personal reasons for doing it, I have my own commitments. Nevertheless, this particular conflict, the Uganda conflict that I will be speaking of, is not my conflict, and when things get really bad, I can leave without losing my homeland. And that will always make a difference. Um, I wish that the voices of the people on whose behalf I am put in a position to speak could be brought to you more directly. Um, that's why I included a clip at the beginning of the presentation just showing you how people live, what they look like. I tried to build the presentation around as many quotes as possible. Um, but having said that, I do ask you to remember that I am an outsider and I'm speaking as an outsider. approximately 100 shillings. Um, 
I'm not sure what kind of background information people are coming in with, so I think that I would like to begin my presentation by speaking a little bit about the Ugandan conflict in general. So as you may know, um, Uganda has been the scene of a two decades long, more than two decades long now, um, civil war in the north between the Lord's Resistance Army and the government of Uganda. Um, this conflict was largely invisible for a long time, sort of from, from the international perspective. However, it has come um, to the fore of the international attention in the last couple of years, in part because of the intensity of the atrocities that were taking place and the fact that they were targeting children um, and um, also because of the massive displacement involved um, at the height of conflict approximately 1.8 million uh, were displaced from the north um, the majority of them uh, were encamped um, and there's a lot of controversy around these camps because while the government claims they were intended to protect the civilian population the Acholi people, in fact, maintained that they were forcibly encamped uh, because the government suspected them of collaboration with the LRA rebels. Um, the war is also very much fratricidal in the sense that the LRA is predominantly Acholi. There are also some, uh, some Lani and, and some Teso uh, participants, but it's seen primarily as an Acholi movement and it's led by an Acholi. Um, uh, Joseph Kony, um, and its primary civilian targets in the north are also Acholi. Um, and quite often, in fact, uh, what would happen is that uh, LRA forces would attack villages and forcibly recruit uh, younger people. Um, I think most people around the world know about the full forcible recruitment of children. Uh, what we found is that a lot of people were abducted when they were young adults, so between 19 and 25. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the abduction of kids that's most dramatic, but in fact it, it was much broader than that. Uh, and people were forcibly recruited into the LRA, often by being forced to commit atrocities against their loved ones. Uh, so what would happen is the LRA would come into a village, uh, single out 30 people, um, and then I randomly pick one person out of that row and tell somebody else to kill them. And if that person refused, they would be beaten to death. And then the next person would be asked. And after two or three people, the fourth person asked would usually do it. They would, they would uh, batter their relative or their neighbor to death. Um, and that was seen as the induction into the LRA. Um, Often children were also forced to commit atrocities specifically against their families in order to break that bond so that they wouldn't return to that village, so that they wouldn't be able to escape. Um, the conflict is also unique in that it was the first case that was referred by a state party to the ICC, uh, which resulted in five arrest warrants being issued for top LRA um, leadership in 2005. So the case is currently in front of the ICC. Um, again, there's, there's sort of massive support for it internationally because of the, the atrocities committed by the LRA, and there's less support for it domestically because among the Acholi people, um, they perceive the government also to be perpetrators. Uh, they say that while the LRA did bad things, the government also came into the camps and raped women and killed people um, so they see both both sides in the conflict as being culpable, and they see the ICC as favoring um, one side, as favoring Museveni's government, uh, who requested that, uh, that the case be investigated. This is a little bit of a misperception. Um, the ICC actually doesn't have jurisdiction to look at crimes that took place before 2002, when the Rome Statute came into effect. So what they've said is that they've investigated both sides, 
Um, but the worst crimes committed by the government were committed before that time period. So they only decided to indict the top leadership of the LRA. And this is a very unpopular decision on the ground because it was also seen as interfering in the peace talks, which began in 2006. Um, these peace talks, known as the Juba peace talks, stalled in 2008. Um, a whole series of agreements were signed before then between the LRA and the government of Uganda, um, including an agreement on, uh, on accountability. Um, which looks at uh, what, what's to be done with the perpetrators of war crimes um, domestically. However, the final peace agreement was never signed, um, and the peace talks stalled in the summer of 2008, uh, when Kony ultimately refused to show up for the signing of the final peace agreement, and his stated reason was that he wanted the ICC warrants to be withdrawn before he committed to doing that. Um, the impression, again, that I'm getting from people is that there is a bit of sort of bad faith on both sides. So I'm not at all convinced that Kony actually would have signed had those warrants not been in place. Um, but um, again, this contributed to the negative perception of the ICC on the ground. Um, and again, it's not entirely the ICC's fault in this case, because once the warrants had been issued, it's not up to the government of Uganda to withdraw them. It's only the prosecutor of the ICC that can withdraw uh, the warrants, and in order to do that, there has to be a case made out that Uganda has parallel systems that can, uh, that, um, sorry, has um, uh, complementary systems that can actually take care of the uh, accountability aspect of things domestically. Uh, and Uganda has been trying to put that system into place, and which is what my organization, the Refugee Law Project, is involved with. Um, what has happened since then is that the Ugandan uh, government has re returned, has dropped the peace option, so to speak, and has returned to a military option. And they followed the LRA into the Congo, uh, along with Congolese and Sudanese forces, and tried to hunt down Joseph Kony and failed to do so. Um, the LRA for the last several months has been heavily recruiting in the Congo. The news where we have now is that they have actually left the Congo and moved up into Darfur with assistance from the Khartoum government. Um, so the conflict remains unresolved, although they, the LRA has not been present in Uganda in any significant way since 2006. And the government is very much pushing people to return. So all those people who had been encamped, and at this point, I mean, at, at the beginning of this process, the, the north really was depopulated, heavily depopulated, because everybody was encamped or had fled elsewhere. Um, now the government is encouraging people to return. There's issues with that because people fear that the conflict will resume, and also they're returning to a place where there's no infrastructure that hasn't been rebuilt, where they have no resources, while humanitarian agencies are cutting off aid to the camps because they're saying it's no longer a humanitarian emergency, people can go back now, so we're not going to be providing assistance in the camps. But there's also nothing on the ground where the people are expected to return to. Um, within this context, what we try to do uh, in this piece of work is go and talk to people who fled not to the camps, but who fled to Kampala. There are other urban areas as well, but we specifically focused the study on Kampala. And we were trying to find out how people in these very affected communities feel about transitional justice processes generally. What they would like to see happen in the country. How do they think about the conflict? What they think would be just. So not what the ICC thinks would be just, not what their politicians are saying, but these people have been forced to leave their homes, often for 20 years at a time. What do they want to happen? Um, what I will be speaking about is a much narrower aspect of that study. I will be speaking about the accountability aspect. So I will be focusing on how people view responsibility for the war um, and some of the reasons why that may be and, and what the implications of that are for a transitional justice process. Um, I should also point out that while this population has a lot in common with other uh, internally displaced people in Uganda, all over Uganda, it's a much smaller population and nobody's, they're doubly marginalized because they officially don't exist. Um, the government of Uganda doesn't want to acknowledge that urban IDPs exist. Um, if they acknowledge it at all, they say, well, they're probably privileged because they're in an urban area. 
Um, our impression has been that that's not the case and we're pushing very hard for a profiling exercise to take place so that we can get a better sense of this community. But there are some sort of other features that differentiate it as well from people who are in the camps, aside from the fact that they get no external assistance. Um, there's also the fact that many of these people were encamped before um, and have fled the camps. And I will be speaking a little bit more about that as I, as I continue. So the specific piece of work that I'm basing my presentation on uh, consisted of 106 individual interviews and five focus group discussions. It was done last year and is the subject of a much bigger paper that I'm happy to make available to people. Um, and it took place in the neighborhoods of Acholi Quarters, Namuongo, and Naguru in Kampala. What you saw there was part of Namuongo, which is a mixed slum. Acholi Quarters is almost exclusively IDPs from the north, and Naguru is also primarily people from the north. And they're all considered slums because the conditions are um, quite horrendous there. And again, many of those we interviewed, in fact most, have a history of multiple displacements, where they originally fled to an IDP camp or were forced into an IDP camp near their original homes um, and couldn't, for whatever reason, couldn't remain there. Now, some of the reasons given were as follows. Um, this is one woman I spoke to who said, uh, we ran from the insurgency that displaced people in the camp. Me, I refused to go to the camp because it was not safe. Some camps were burned and people died. I just remembered a Choli P refugee camp where the rebels attacked and killed over 300 refugees. This made me hate the camp since the rebels could come up to the camp and abduct people and loot food items distributed by World Food Program. And in fact, what happened in a lot of the camps is although the army was supposed to be pr protecting the civilian population, the army uh, barracks would be at the center of the camp. So effectively, the civilian population was a buffer between the army and the LRA. And the LRA would regularly attack after food distributions, both to recruit people and in order to, uh, to loot. Um, and the army itself was involved in a lot of the looting and, and quite a number of the atrocities that took place. Um, Again, some of the other reasons why people left the camps, aside from general security, is if they had been abducted by the LRA before, and abductions were widespread, they feared being re-abducted, because that would mean a death sentence if they were recognized as somebody who had escaped. Um, and there were LRA infiltrators in the camp. Um, a lot of parents told me that they fled specifically because children were being targeted in the north, and they felt the entire area was unsafe, they wanted to protect their kids, the safest place to flee to was Kampala. Um, finally, there's a high number of former combatants in Kampala as well. These are people who were originally abducted from their villages, forced to commit atrocities in their villages, and for that reason they can't or don't want to return home because they fear the reaction of their friends and neighbors. So they're kind of stuck um, in Kampala. And, and the final thing I wanted to say is that in the case of the study, one striking thing is that many people told me they had left um, after a particularly traumatic event. So things had been going really badly for a while. They had fled their village for the camp. And then, for instance, there was a spate of, of attacks that involved cannibalism, where people were forced to watch their loved ones being cooked and, and were asked to eat them. And that, for many people, was sort of something they just couldn't, it, it was inconceivable and they just wanted at that point to get as far away from the region as they could get. That's what motivated the flight to Kampala. When asked the question of who is responsible for the conflict, the first answer that almost everybody gave us, and by the way, I should say that I am, I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't mention this before, this study was conducted in conjunction with my, uh, with my uh, um, colleague, uh, Bernardo Cotcasosi, who is actually himself, which was extremely helpful for a number of reasons. So what we were told repeatedly is that Kony is seen as, as being the primary culprit, Joseph Kony, the leader of the LRA. Um, and people would tell us things like, I know Kony, for one, will not be forgiven for what he did to our people in northern Uganda. All the blame is on him because all orders to the rebels came from him. He must be responsible for all the bad things done by his subordinates. 
Now, Kony himself is a Choli, and he's accepted as an Acholi, but the feeling among the community seems to be that he put the welfare, he put his own ambitions ahead of the welfare of his own people. Because when, when the rebellion first began, it actually had popular support. It was seen as a reaction against repression by the Museveni government and against years of marginalization. So the LRA was actually a popular movement initially. But as it started to lose support, it turned against its own people, began to commit atrocities against um, civilians. And people feel very strongly that that part was not okay, that, that uh, Kony should have accepted defeat rather than put his own people at risk. The second culprit that was always named is the government. Uh, and the government is seen as a best failing to protect, but often people also speak of the government in terms of contributing to the conflict and keeping it going in order to weaken the Acholi people who were traditionally in opposition to the regime. So they would say things like, it's the role of government to protect its people and properties. How come the government has failed to protect us from Kony, yet it's their job to do so? They have all the superior weapons, yet have taken more than 20 years to fight that rebellion. Not all the killing was by Kony, the government also contributed. And that's a very typical sentiment. A really interesting finding is that the vast majority of people, both combatants themselves, former combatants themselves, and the community, do not see combatants as being responsible for the actions that they committed while in the bush, while uh, fighting the conflict. The explanation offered for this, this is by somebody who is a non-combatant, is because when the rebels come, and rebels are not their fault, they have to live their fearing. When they go to bush, they become rebels, become wild people. When they attack you, you also have to accept them, stay with them alive. There is nothing they can do, cannot overthrow government. They suffer there a lot, become enemies even to their relatives. One of my brothers was taken from us, became wild. This statement actually contains a lot of things that I want to talk a little bit more about in depth. Um, first of all, um, everybody spoke about recruitment into the LRA in terms of abductions. And this is part of both a broader national rhetoric and a local rhetoric, because the, the government has a stake in not acknowledging that that rebellion initially had some popular support. They have really demonized the LRA and, and presented it as, as a cult, essentially. Um, and so the government rhetoric has been nobody joins willingly, everybody's abducted. And people have accepted that rhetoric. So even though we know that some people have, especially initially, joined the LRA willingly, these days everybody presents themselves as having been abducted. Now having said that, the abductions were extremely widespread. At the, at the height of conflict, uh, pretty much nobody was immune. And I don't have the statistics for it, I was trying to find them this morning, but it's rare to speak to somebody Pretty much everybody that we spoke to had either a close relative or they had themselves been abducted. No, not everybody was inducted into the LRA. That was mostly reserved for younger uh, people, both men and women. Uh, however, older people would still be abducted as porters and may be released after two or three weeks. Um, so, so the fact that you could be abducted, that you could face yourself with a situation where you had to choose between death and killing, was on everybody's minds. This is not an inconceivable situation for anybody in this community. They know perfectly well that it could have happened to them. Secondly, it's acknowledged that young people were often targeted, and often they were children. They were often, you know, as young as 10 to 12 years old. Sometimes they were teenagers. Um, and there is quite a bit of compassion for that in the communities. Um, you know, people talk about how if you're a child and you're taken from your family, you can be made to do horrific things. And then once you're in the bush, you sort of lose a sense of, lose a, lose a moral focus that's, you know, you're having been brutalized and not being able to escape. The third thing is that this is sort of truly fratricidal in the sense that the perpetrators of these atrocities are often the sons and daughters of the victims. So again, not only in the process of induction were children forced to commit atrocities against their immediate families, um, but in the broader sense, this all happens within one ethnic group. So nobody is arguing that this is outsiders who committed these crimes. Everybody acknowledges that it's their own children, essentially, that are responsible. 
And also the methods of induction used by the LRA were very broadly known. Uh, and people would, would repeatedly tell me um, of how you had no choice, how if the LRA attacked your village, um, you had to choose between being killed yourself and joining the LRA, and, and how people were killed for trying to rebel against that, or how people were killed if they tried to escape. Um, so there is kind of a sense of people are quite likely to put themselves in that position, to say, you know, what would I have done in the shoes of my child if this had happened to me? As a result of all of this, perpetrators in the community are also perceived as victims. Um, and again, I'm not speaking here of the very, very high level, specifically Joseph Kony and maybe one or two of his commanders. I'm talking about everybody below that. Even people who had joined willingly initially, even people who had maybe stayed in the bush and achieved very high positions, are still perceived as victims of the war. And they also perceive themselves in that regard, in that way. What this seems to lead to is that while combatants are not seen as legally responsible for their actions during, um, during the conflict, they are seen as morally and spiritually damaged by them. And again, this is consistent both in the non-combatant um, community and among the people who themselves admit to having returned from the bush and to having committed atrocities while there. People actually do talk about that. It's, it's maybe surprising. There is an amnesty in place, so, so that may help that may be why people talk about it. But they are quite willing to talk about the things they were forced to do in the bush. And this is a quote, a very typical quote, again, from an ex-combatant, a female ex-combatant who watched, first she watched her husband being murdered in front of her, and then she was inducted into the LRA. I think I am not responsible for what I did, because I did them under the influence of commanders. I know I killed, beat people, and abducted some few people, burned houses, and even looted people's properties. Those, that are, those are all what I pray to God to forgive me on them, because I know I was misled force, forcefully. When you are in the bush, you feel all what you are told to do or what others are doing is all right. But when you come out, you begin to realize that all those things I did while in the bush are all bad. I am repenting and repenting, but still I am not seeing any big change in me. So this is a unique community in the sense that they are faced head on with, with human capacity for evil, and it can't easily be displaced onto another group. You can't say, well, this group of people is just bad, because people are very aware that it's their own group members um, that are responsible, that their own family members. Um, and often the, the way this is spoken about is in terms of something called a Morawan, which is, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it dreadfully, but it, it's the equivalent of possession. It's, a, it's an entirely belief that when you kill somebody, you kill an innocent person, or you commit some seriously wrong act, like rape, the, this, but especially killing, um, the spirit of that person will enter into you and it will cause you to continue doing bad things until you are cleansed. So the people who return, often people return from the bush and they are quite troubled. And, and the interpretation both by themselves and by the community is that it's the acts they committed in the bush that are literally haunting them and will continue to haunt them unless, it's, unless those issues are addressed. Again, this is sort of an explanation of Amora Wang. Amorawang is a very common thing with the returnees. The Amorawang is ten, that ten meaning ghost, that attacks a person. The first part that it attacks affects is the head. It makes their eyes wide and makes them prone to carry out violence. It destabilizes the functions in the head and makes a person behave like a mad person by always reacting violently and wanting to cause violence. The elders have to remedy it by identifying the cause of the Amorawang before it, can, it is dealt with. The person will be called to tell what he did wrong to anyone, because most Amorawang occurs when the person kills or does something seriously very wrong to another. So the, the traditional treatment for Amorawang is that the perpetrator has to confess to the elders of the clan his actions, and if those actions involve killing, the elders will then sacrifice to the dead and will apologize to the dead for what took place and will plead for their forgiveness. Um, so there is an element of truth-telling. You have to tell everything that happened, although you only do it within your immediate community. Um, and 
Now, the sort of last thing I want to talk about is the implications of this for transitional justice. The first is that the dichotomy that has been set up between forgiveness and accountability is false. That a lot of the discussions around Uganda now focus on these ideas that um, traditionally the Acholi always forgave and therefore they support forgiveness. Um, and, and the fact that the ICC is pushing for accountability. In fact, when you go into the community, people want a combination of measures, and they, want, they, they are much more subtle in their approach. What they're saying is that different accountability mechanisms should be used for different perpetrators. Often people would tell me, for example, that they want to see Kony go through a formal criminal trial, that they think, in fact, that he, they think he should be executed for what he's done. But they don't want those processes to be applied to their children, to the, to, to the sort of lower ranking um, LRA members. Um, the fact that they, they are willing to forgive because they acknowledge that there's no sort of, they don't see the perpetrators as being legally responsible for what they did because they think they were acting under coercion. But they do see them as being morally and spiritually damaged and psychologically damaged and requiring help. Um, in order to be able to return back into the community. So there is a form of accountability there. They have to go and confess their crimes to the elders. And I just want to end with this last quote, which I thought was, was quite poignant uh, and summarizes some of what I've been speaking about. The LRA, of course, has done many terrible things, but are they ready to accept what they did was wrong, so forgiveness is there? But if they still insist what they did was right, there needs to be external accountability. If they ask to be forgiven, accept responsibility, they should be forgiven. Pardon is given to someone who asks for it, not somebody who does not.